guys, welcome to another episode of Let's Go World War 2. So, podcast. Okay, so now, chapter 6. Who dares wins? Remain in the Special Air Service. September 14, 1941. Octo- to October 28, 1942. More after that. When you enter a room full of the enemy, Kill the first one that moves. He has started to think, and it therefore is dangerous. Major Paddy Main, 1st Special Air Service, or SAS Regiment. The story of Robert Paddy Main reads like something out of a hardcore action movie or the intro to a first-person shooter video game. A gritty, ultra-tough royal commando sits alone in a rat-infested cell in some hellhole in Egypt awaiting a court-martial. A six-foot-four-inch, two-hundred-pound warrior from Northern Ireland is there because he punched a superior officer and then tried to kill the guy with a bayonet. It was his second arrest in the last year. A few months back, he dragged a bartender out of the crowd nightclub and made him dance by shooting at the poor chump's feet with a revolver. Now, Captain Maine is staring defiantly ahead when suddenly a light comes on in the dungeon and a familiar face looms up at the bars. A tall, steel-jawed Scottish aristocrat Lieutenant Colonel David Sterling has come with an offer. Sit here and rot, or help me lead a small elite squad of black OPS special power forces. We'll be going deep behind enemy lines in the Sahara Desert and wreaking havoc on some germ- on the German army's most ferocious troops. It's a suicide mission, packed with glory and death, mashed together like a bullet sandwich. The best case scenario has you coming home to take a box, but you'll get to kill a lot of Nazis in the process. I like to imagine Patty Maine staring grimly at David Sterling for a full minute, then asking when he can get started. In the closing weeks of 1941, things were go- looking bad for the Allies in World War II. Really bad. Hitler's goose-stepping hordes of soldiers stretched from Paris to Moscow, holding all of Europe in a fearsome grip. Now Hitler was beginning to stretch his talons into North Africa as well, thanks to the efforts of Marshal Erwin Johannes Eugen Rommel, a master of blitzkrieg so brilliant and deadly he was known to the British as the Desert Fox. Rommel had been called into North Africa after Mussolini's Italians had failed to conquer Libya. And in just a few months, the desert force, I mean the desert fox, told, took a demoralized Italian force and turned it into a world-destroying juggernaut, an old-school soldier who earned Germany's top award for military bravery, bravery by storming enemy positions during World War I. Rommel literally wrote the book on fighting with infantry in modern combat. Seriously, it's called Infantry Attacks. And it was read by everyone from Hitler to U.S. General George S. Patton. Rommel led Alpine troops through the mountains during World War I and commanded the Fuhrer's bodyguard unit during the invasion of Poland. His 7th Panzer Division formed one arm of the pincer that helped Guderian destroy the French army in the early days of the war. Now in command of the elite German Afrika Corps, the Desert Fox staged blitzkrieg attacks that routinely outmaneuvered, encircled, and destroyed British forces from Libya to Cairo. By 1942, he had already put Nazi Germany in an excellent position to seize Egypt the Suez Canal, a waterway connecting the Red Sea and the Mediterranean Sea, and the oil fields of the Middle East from Great Britain's control. This would be disastrous for the Allies. And it was up to men like Paddy Main and David Sterling to help stop it. The Africa Corps seemed unstoppable on the battlefield, but it did have one weakness, its supply lines. 
with Rommel's troops spread out across North Africa and not many roads to drive on, there was a huge pain to bring necessary food, bullets, bombs, fuel, and reinforcements all the way from Rommel's base in Tripoli to his front lines on the Egyptian border. Sterling decided that if Great Britain couldn't win the war on the front lines, he could sure as heck cut up Rommel's reinforcements. So he formed a unit known simply as L Detachment to deal with it. He n- we know it better today as the Special Air Service, the British SAS, one of the world's first special o- forces operations. A small team of 60 men were, were hand-picked for their toughness, fighting spirit, and ability to survive in inhuman, inhuman situations. Climbing 100-foot sand dunes in the 130-degree heat of the Sahara Desert and braving sandstorms, flash floods, dehydration, and sub-zero nighttime temperatures, the men of El Detachment were expected to be the best of the best. Their mission was to go in with guns blazing and hammer Nazi airfields, supply dumps, and refueling stations with no hope of reinforcements or rescue then get the heck out of there before anyone knew what had happened. To accomplish this superhuman task, the SAS had 20 customized four-wheel drive jeeps, all tricked out with extra ammo, fuel, bombs, grenades, and spare tires. They were packing twin-linked 303 caliber Vickers machine guns mounted on the passenger side of the vehicle. Their tactics were straightforward and honestly completely bonkers drive through the Sahara Desert at night, blow past minefields, rocked, wrecked vehicles, and quicksand using nothing but the stars and a compass for direction. Google Maps hadn't been invented yet. Then drive the jeep straight into the German airstrips and open fire at anything with a, with a swap sticker painted on it. Pedal to the metal, the SAS would chuck bombs and grenades and fire their machine guns, then peel out, leaving nothing but smoking craters and ruins in their wake. If that sounds awesome and insane, it was. Paddy Main, the second in command, quickly earned a reputation for being the most die-hard and fearless man in El Detachment. In the middle of one of his first nights when German troops scrambling around trying to figure out what was going on, Main ran over to an undestroyed Nazi bomber planted a plastic explosive, a powerful explosive material that feels a lot like Play-Doh on it, then calmly walked back to his jeep at the air, as the aircraft violently exploded behind him. The entire raid lasted just 15 minutes, but by the time dawn broke, over 30 German aircraft had been destroyed, a dozen more were damaged, and an anti-aircraft gun had been knocked out of action. Just one SAS man had been killed. In another mission, Maine drove his jeep up to the barbed wire surrounding the base, crawled underneath it, blew up 24 German planes with homemade bombs, then kicked the door uh, open of the German barracks and sprayed it with fire from his submachine gun. Anyone still moving had to deal with Maine, a hulking former member of the British National Rugby team in the 1936 Irish University's heavyweight boxing champ. After punching out Nazis and flicking the switch on the bomb detonators, May noticed that one ME-109 fighter plane hadn't exploded, so he ran over to the aircraft and pulled the control panel out of the cockpit with his bare hands before running back to his jeep and escaping. Less than a week later, he was back at it again pulling off another wild, gunslinging jeep raid that destroyed 27 Nazi fighters, bombers, and transport planes. From December 1941 through October 1942, the men of El Detachment successfully pulled off 40 daring weight raids, blowing up everything from fuel depots and ammo dumps to air strips and communications posts. They've been credited with destroying 320 German aircraft during this period, almost single-handedly crippling the Luftwaffe in North Africa with nothing more than two dozen jeeps and a ton of plastic explosive. Without all those German fighter planes to give them trouble, the British Desert Air Force was able to hammer the German trucks and supply planes as they tried to bring desperately needed material to Rommel's front lines. 
the desert force, the, I mean the desert fox, resorted to drastic measures, including using captured British trucks and fuel to keep his panzers running. But in the end, he simply ran out of gas and ammunition. An estimated two thirds of the supplies and reinforcements sent to him from Germany were either sunk in the Mediterranean by the Royal Navy, blown up by the Desert Air Force, or trashed by the SAS. In October 1942, the Germans attempted one more blitz, but reached the, the limit of their supply lines outside the British controlled city of El Alamein in Egypt. The British commander, Field Marshal Bernard Montgomery, seized the opportunity. He launched a gutsy night attack on the evening of October 28th, spearheaded by troops from all across the British Empire, Canadians, Australians, Scots, New Zealanders, South Africans, and Indians, all bravely hurled themselves into the fray. Under the cover of an artillery barrage, the 51st Scots Highlanders belted out songs on their bagpipes as British Ten Corps tanks and infantry from New Zealand and Australia bayonets stormed through a minefield into Rommel's forces. The Desert Force, unable to maneuver his blitzkrieg, found himself being hammered on the defensive. It would be the first major battlefield defeat of his career. Badly bloodied, Rommel's forces limped out of Egypt. Bernard Monty Montgomery chased them for three months back to Tripoli. U.S. troops under George S. Patton landed on the west coast of North Africa in early 1943, and the Axis forces in North Africa were squeezed out on both sides. They would surrender a few months later. As for Paddy Maine, he ended up taking over command of the Neil Lee Christen 1st SAS Regiment after Lieutenant Colonel Sterling was captured during a raid in 1943. Maine would lead his team on more dangerous raids across Italy, including one time when he and 50 soldiers landed on a beach in the middle of the night, climbed a sheer cliff face with ropes and grappling hooks, attacked an Italian fortress, killed or captured 700 guys, blew up their coastal artillery, and drank all their wine. Another time, he mounted machine guns on rubber rafts and captured the town of Termoli then held it for three days against repeated German counterattacks. Later in France, he rescued a pinned-down team of Canadian soldiers by kicking out the windshield of a jeep, resting a Bren machine gun on the dash, and driving straight into enemy territory. He controlled the steering wheel with his left hand and shot the gun with his right, piling wounded men up in the back of the jeep whenever he encountered them. How there hasn't been a Jason Statham movie about this guy is beyond me. After the war, Paddy Maine, the original founder of the SAS, would retire to a quiet life raising chickens and going on Antarctic expeditions. He was denied the Victoria Cross, Britain's highest military honor, on the grounds of being a jerk to all his commanding officers, but he remains the only man in the British military to receive a distinguished service order. The Distinguished Service Order, the second highest military honor on four separate occasions.